Yesterday, when I met uh, Professor Hunt, I was thinking how to make a connection with a so uh, highly respected scientist. When we entered the room together, we just found a common smile. And after a few uh, seconds later, we were in deep discussion about life and about science. I guess this is one uh, very good indicator of a brave man. Wherever he is, he could make very easily connections with other scientists. This is also maybe one of the beauties of the science itself. Sir uh, Timothy Hunt, uh, who is called all over the world Tim Hunt, was born during the Second World War in England. I guess it was a very hard time uh, for his parents, and also it was very hard to be uh, healthy and well-fed during this uh, period of the history. His parents were educated people, and uh, uh, his father worked in medieval science. Uh, he was uh, studying the medieval age, and uh, of course, uh, there was a great opportunity for the family to live in Oxford, which is the nest of the science for centuries. When he got interested to study something, it was obvious that he was exposed to foreign languages, Greek and Latin, and uh, uh, it was a it was a interesting time for the young man because he didn't know what to be interested in, but I guess uh, uh, studying languages is always an opportunity to see other cultures. As I was uh, reading his autobiography or short version of it, I realized that uh, Professor Hunt is very thankful to his early teachers. The early teachers who made him interested in science. First, he mentions that the first thing which he was interested in was the biology because he was inspired by his biology teacher. When he uh, got a little bit older, he moved into the Madeline College School where he was also uh, influenced by his teacher in chemistry. And therefore, the path was almost ready. Languages, biology and chemistry. And Oxford was always, during that time, also a melting pot of scientists. Some of the former Nobel laureates always were in the city, so he had a chance to see uh, the son of Bedley, uh, Bidley, who got Nobel Prize in 1958. So therefore, he was interested in the modern biology, the modern approach of cell biology. So <clears throat> when he finished his studies in Oxford, he, he went to Cambridge he, when he continued his uh, study and studied biochemistry. Uh, in 1964, uh, he finished the university and was offered a, a position by the University of Cambridge. When I read uh, this story of the, his, uh, this period of life, I sense that he mentions that there was a scientific f freedom in the laboratory he joined. The professor who led the laboratory didn't influence the young people, just showed, okay, you can study RNA, protein synthesis, uh, DNA, whatever you want, but do it uh, with your best uh, uh, abilities. So four, year late, four years later, he got his PhD and uh, started to work on interesting uh, uh, areas of the uh, cell biology, mainly on the synthesis and the uh, phases of the synthesis of hemoglobin. I guess that uh, the general knowledge he gained was uh, good enough to join leading laboratories overseas. 
He went to uh, the United States and uh, um, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He started and continued his studies on this interesting field. Uh, he got also an opportunity to work in the marine uh, biology laboratory in Massachusetts, in Woods Hole. Woods Hole is a very uh, important place for scientists, especially in summer. And I just like mentioned that uh, during the late years of his life, Albert Sanger worked in also Woods Hole. So these years, uh, his interest uh, got deeper and deeper in the regulation of the cell division, uh, regulation of and, and the dynamics of the cell division and how it is periodically inhibited and enhanced by various factors, uh, protein kinases, and uh, later on it uh, led to the discovery of the cyclins, cyclin A and B, and uh, he described how to, uh, to understand this very beautiful uh, period of the cell life. He used various animal uh, model, models, mainly marine models, therefore he was tied to, a little bit to Massachusetts for this uh, activity. Went back and forth between uh, England and, and uh, United States, but later he ended in London and, and he continued his uh, scientific work in a cancer research center in London. I guess his uh, achievements were uh, very early recognized by the scientific community. His uh, early papers are still cited, and uh, I guess the most uh, relevant uh, publication appeared in 1983, where he exactly uh, described what was uh, the basis of his uh, huge achievement. So as usually happens, the scientific community after these discoveries waited some time when it got uh, uh, reinforced and, and it got uh, recognized in other laboratories in, in 2001. <laughs> He got Nobel Prize with other colleagues, with Professor Hartwell and with Professor Nurse, uh, uh, together the T three uh, excellent scientists. I watched in the in the internet uh, the ceremony of the uh, Nobel uh, Award ceremony, and I, I saw how these people were were accepted uh, uh, this uh, high uh, uh, recognition and I can understand how big it is because even through the uh, YouTube you can see the, uh, the tension in the, in the room. And uh, I guess uh, Professor Hunt is ambassador of the science. He goes all over the world. He'd like to convince young people politicians, uh, whoever is influential in the scientific life to put more money, to get more uh, space, to uh, get uh, more and more resources for the science because science is fun. Doing science is maybe more fun than, uh, than talking about it. And in his uh, book, uh, he writes that Teaching is okay, but learning is maybe better because you can uh, have a very good feeling when you learn and understand new things. So as a, a recognition uh, that I think is worth mentioning, he got knighted uh, by the Queen of England and he uh, bears the uh, title of Sir Tim Hunt, and uh, I guess uh, this makes him proud, and I guess he has everything to be being proud of. We are also proud of having him here, and it is uh, the third time for him being in Seged. 
I hope that he will enjoy his uh, time and the rest of his staying, and hopefully we will get inspiration to work harder and being inspired by his words. Please. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So, before I begin, I think I should mention my wife's opinion. Uh, she says, and it's appropriate because this is the 10th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana. Actually, that was yesterday. And she was known as the People's Princess. So, um, my wife says oh, you should think of me as the People's Laureate. And by this she means that if I can win a Nobel Prize, anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll try and show you that I think that's, I think that's true. Um, the main element in winning Nobel Prizes is uh, a certain, mostly luck actually. And that's really what I want to demonstrate, sort of luck and keeping your eyes open. So this is the thing you're aiming for. And by the way, some people say that prizes are bad. I actually think that Nobel Prizes are quite good. Not only, of course, because I got one, and it comes with a lot of money. <laughs> we'll go into that in a, in a second. Um, but also because I think it's OK. I mean, why would you not, if you're a scientist or any kind of scholar, want to find out the most important thing that you possibly could? and then tell the world about it. I mean, the, it seems to me there is absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with that. And recently, I had an interview with uh, an old friend of mine, and I sort of realized in the course of that that um, Nobel Prizes are usually given for doing something impossible. So you have to be a bit foolish and a lot ambitious, probably, to, to, to win a Nobel Prize, too. Um, because most of the recent ones I can think of, you know, like I was told, for example, that um, when I was a student, your, your age, it was, the lecturers said, the professor told us it was impossible to sequence DNA. You would never know the sequence of DNA. Well, now we know that Fred Sanger and others figured out how to do it. And because it was impossible, they won a Nobel Prize. Likewise, we were told it would be impossible to solve the structure of the ribosome. It was too big, too complicated. But, uh, what was it, five years ago or so, people finally solved the structure of the ribosome and they were awarded a Nobel Prize. So, um, you know, I wouldn't advise you to find an impossible project and then go for it. But if you see that you have the clue to an impossible project and can solve it, then do go for it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference. I mean, I, it will, perhaps we'll go back to that. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So here, here is my Nobel Prize. You can just about see it. It says Tim Hunt on the bottom there. That's very good to have your name on this thing. <laughs> um, and the question is, what is it worth? So you may be surprised to hear that I gave my prize away. I really didn't, it sort of felt like the Nibelung's gold, you know, that uh, you would be cursed if you held on to this thing. And I'd heard that sometimes, you know, you could put it in the bank vault, but what's the point of having the bloody thing in the bank vault? I mean, that's stupid. So I gave it to my old college, which had been the life support system, and they have a very secure safe, and it was sort of traditional that fellows of the college gave them a piece of gold or silver, and so this seemed like a very good way to get rid of it. Before I did that, my wife said, wait a minute, you know, how much is this thing worth? So uh, here's the answer. It was then worth, it was 200 grams, you can look it up on the internet, 200 grams of pure gold, okay? And in 2001, it was 1,500 pounds. Well, that may sound like quite a lot of money to give away, but when you hear that I got a check for 213,000 pounds, as my share, you will realize that this represented 0.7% of the total. So, ah, don't need it, <laughs> right? However, if I had hung on to it and sold it in 2012, I could have got 7,000 pounds for it because the, 
And now it's very interesting, actually. The, the, you can see the price of gold is pretty volatile. It goes up and down. It's only 5,000 pounds now. So, but it's interesting to know if it had been 3.3%, we might have begun to... You know. ah, anyway. <laughs> so um, this is the alternative title. Um, how to win the Nobel Prize, or wild speculation based on faulty logic. This was what a referee wrote about the Nobel Prize winning paper. And I think that's interesting too, because uh, you know, people really don't like new ideas. And um, fortunately, with the other referee was Paul Nurse, who said, I think this is pretty interesting and rather important. So that, I got a very funny letter from the editor saying, you know, dear Tim, the good news is we will publish your paper, but the bad news is in nothing like its present form. So it had to be rewritten. And the problem was that it was all about sea urchins, as we'll come to later, and there were no sea urchins in Cambridge, and there could not be any sea urchins and their eggs until the following summer. So it was quite, we couldn't do any more experiments. We just had to uh, tone down the, the, the paper. And unfortunately, I don't have a first draft because in those days, everything was typewritten. I don't think we had computer. We had word processors only just beginning to come in. And uh, I, I didn't, didn't keep a copy of the first version, which is a shame. I'd like to see it. So let's start at the beginning. There's my dad, and that's my mother. That's my uh, middle brother, Sandy. So I think he, what does he look like? He might be six months or something like that, maybe a year old. So that makes me only two there, something like that. And this is in near Liverpool, in, in Park Gate. And that's my cousin, Wendy, uh, an, uh, an uncle and an aunt and grandmother. So uh, another, another aunt. So I had a pretty normal kind of family life, I guess, to begin with. But I grew up in Oxford, which was, is not a very normal place. Um, in fact, I got to know quite a lot about the differences between Oxford and Cambridge, because I later went to, to Cambridge. And the truth of the matter is that in Cambridge, two-thirds of the people are scientists, and in Oxford, two-thirds of the people are not. So Oxford was dominated by philosophers and linguists and medievalists and things. I remember my, I had a, a godfather who was a great friend of my dad who was a very distinguished medieval historian. And he became a fellow of All Souls, which is a college that has no students, just fellows. And he said, oh, Tim, he said, we've just elected our first scientist. Up to then, they'd never had any scientists in this college. He's an expert on butterflies. <laughs> Actually, I think it was the expert who discovered industrial melanism. He was an E.B. Ford who um, worked on evolution. But anyway, he was an expert on butterflies. So I, I grew up in this sort of environment. And my first real sort of public, uh, this is me at the age of about seven as a fairy in a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, <laughs> And that, his dad wrote the first biography of Hitler. He's, that's Nicky Bullock. And I, I don't know what happened to Cussy Duet. And I don't know who these people are. Did she turn out to be a famous actress or was she just an undergraduate or, or what? I was very proud of this performance because this was the Oxford University Dramatic Society. I mean, you know, really quite a good acting debut for a young boy. Anyway, so I, I did a fair amount of that as a, as a school child. And it turns out that sort of, you know, act, performing on stages is very useful, not for its own sake, but because it makes you more confident in situations like this. So I don't know whether any of you do any sort of amateur dramatics, but it is, it's, it's not a bad thing, actually, and it's good fun. So the, the first really important guy I met was this, this man here, Gert Summerhoff, who sadly died before I was able to uh, see him again and, 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 and say thank you. And um, when I sent him an email, he clearly didn't remember who I was, which is not surprising because it was a very long time uh, ago and he'd been through a lot and was an old man. But he was an inspiring teacher. He, he was the kind, we only had one science lesson a week, but I really looked forward to it because it had bangs and smells and you know, excite, things that excited boys. And uh, in fact, his instructions were <laughs> from the headmaster when he took over was just get them interested. I mean, isn't that terrific? That's so wonderful compared to what happens today. I mean, my poor 
girls who get taught biology. It's just a list of things you have to remember. There is absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. And it's, they don't even explain what's going on. I think it's absolutely terrible. But Gert got us interested and tried always to explain what was going on behind the scenes. You know, what were the invisible things that were causing the visible events? And that was, that was uh, terrific. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of this. In, most of you won't even recognize what this is because you're much too young. But in my day, radio sets and television sets were full of these thermionic valves. And it was kind of easy to understand what they were and how they worked. Whereas today, when you, you look at your iPhone, I mean, it doesn't have any components. They're all sort of hidden away and you can't even get at them. But in those days, you could take things apart and they were useful and you could reconfigure them to make, to make things. So that was, uh, was a lot of that. Leave that there. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I sort of did okay. I became interested in... Um, as the Dean said, in, in, in chemistry. And so biochemistry was the the thing, and Cambridge seemed like a good place to go. Also, it was a way of getting away from home and out of range of parental control, so that was important too. Um, and this is really where I started to learn uh, how to be a scientist. Not so much from my teachers, I would say, at the time, but from my peers, the, my fellow, fellow students. And of course, it was a little bit shocking at first when you got to Cambridge because uh, the other students were very clever. One wasn't used to being surrounded by so many very clever people. In fact, you found that most of the people knew much more about much more than you did. So that, I mean, you know, my main feeling, at least to begin with an undergraduate, was simply how ignorant I was and how much there was to understand about the world uh, around me and how little I understood. And, and of course, Cambridge has a fantastic tradition of science, uh, going back to, to Newton. And I think this is a wonderful quote from Newton, who was, after all, above all, a sort of wonderful mathematician and analyzed the, the world um, in, in, in mathematical terms and even had to invent a calculus in order to uh, better um, figure it out. But here he is writing to the then president of the Royal Society, you know, the proper method for inquiring after the properties of things is to deduce them from experiments. And this is, I think, tremendously important because even this great man who was so theoretically well endowed, nevertheless, you know, tells us that you must always ask nature, am I right? Is this really the way things work? Do the experiment. So I used to walk through this uh, doorway in Cambridge, and this is the old Cavendish, the physics, the, where, where the physics department used to be, and no longer is. I can't remember what these things are. So I think that's, this is the mathematical laboratory, the computer lab now. And I used to walk through there, and as I walked through, I realized that this was a pretty fantastic place I was walking into, because let's forget about Newton. He, he, didn't, he didn't work there, but Maxwell was the first professor there. Uh, Thompson had discovered the electron. Rutherford had defined uh, the atom, found the atomic nucleus, the proton, and the neutron, and the, the atom was first split. And then their successors, uh, Watson and Crick, worked in that physics department also and worked out the structure of DNA. Although, remember, the chemical structure of DNA was also worked out in Cambridge, but in the chemistry lab up the road, Dan Brown and, and Alex Todd. Did, did that. And then Kendra and Perutz, of course, worked out how to solve the structure of protein. So just within 50 yards, you know, amazing. I mean, this is a fantastic list of uh, human achievement of an understanding of nature. And, um, you know, if you were feeling good, you'd say, ha-ha, you know, I'm part of this grand tradition. But generally, one wasn't feeling so good. So you'd go through that, and, oh, God, you know, I, I can't deal with this because it's too much. I mean, this is a terrible burden to, to bear. There's no way I can discover the next neutron or whatever it might be. And just a little tiny aside, I, I, this was prompted by reading um, a biography of Einstein, actually, by a guy called Abraham Pace, 
who is now dead, unfortunately, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. He points out that the traditional atom is flat. And it's always represented as flat, or almost always, in, in advertisements and things like that. But obviously the hydrogen atom is not flat. <laughs> It's spherical, and it apparently it took till 1925 before it, for the atom to become uh, spherical. I think that's funny, you know. How our perception of reality is influenced by cartoonists, usually too simple. Anyway, but perhaps fortunately I was no good at physics, and so that avenue, I would love to understand how light interacts with electrons but I simply don't. I really, really do not understand how light passes through water. I mean, people say, oh, well, that's because it's not absorbed. Well, of course it's not absorbed because it comes through. But then I asked a friend, you know, so is the photon that goes in the front pane of glass the same as the photon that comes out the other side? Um, my friend, who is a physicist, said, smiled, and a, a sort of condescending smile. So, Tim, he said, that is a meaningless question. <laughs> and then I knew that I was no good at physics. <laughs> so, uh, but I was good at biology and not bad at chemistry. I wasn't terribly good at chemistry. I couldn't, I, the, the awful secret is that I'm really useless at maths. The only exam I ever failed in my life was a maths exam, because um, I simply couldn't do calculus. Um, and, um, so I couldn't do physical chemistry, which is also a, a, a bit of a hindrance, but it turns out not an insuperable one. So I joined this department, which should have been founded by this man here, and which indeed, um, Shent Georgi himself, uh, where he got his PhD. And you'll sort of see the kind of department it was in Shent Georgi's day. First of all, it was a very left wing. They were almost all communists, um, politically very active. And second of all, they were tremendously ambitious. I mean, they really wanted to understand, you know, what life was and to explain life in terms of physics and chemistry. And, um, you know, chemical aspects of the morphogenetic fields and whereas it, the economy of the bacteria was one of those, this woman was one of the first people to really seriously work on bacteria. In some way, yes, a speculation on, on muscle. This was probably where Shen Georgi got his interest in, in, in muscle uh, biology, actually. I suspect. But anyway, he, he discovered vitamin C while he was there as his PhD. Uh, came back here and proved that that's what it was. So uh, how did I, so I, you know, I passed my exams and it was possible to do a PhD in this department and um, I was very grateful for that. And I wondered what to work on and um, I went to my supervisor and said, what shall I work on? He said, well, why don't you go to the library? and find yourself a problem. Now, I think not many PhD advisors would say that kind of thing today. They'd more likely to hand you a problem. But anyway, Asher did that, and so I went to the library, found a good problem, and to cut a long story short, it didn't work. I used the wrong kind of rat, and it didn't, didn't work. So I didn't, after about six months or so, I didn't have a problem anymore. And then luckily, uh, and they didn't know what to do, I really had no idea, and luckily, we went to this scientific meeting, which was about hemoglobin synthesis and its control. And I heard two talks which were to be influential, one from this man here, Henry Borsuk, who is a Caltech professor, and one from Vernon Ingram, who is a, an MIT professor. And in the short term, it was this guy who inspired me. In the long term, it was, it was uh, that one. So Borsuk's talk was comparing sea urchin eggs with red cell development. Well, they don't have very much in common, actually. It's a rather peculiar comparison. Both, however, are round. That's all they have in common. Uh, but the important thing was that Ingram uh, gave a talk, and when we got back to the lab, it was clear that this great scientist had got it completely wrong. And we graduate students just worked out that he'd misinterpreted his data by 180 degrees. And I don't quite know how it was, and when I say we, these are the important people, Tony Hunter on the left, as he was as a graduate student, uh, Lou Reichart, fairly recent uh, photograph on the right, and Lou knew how to make rabbit reticulocytes and was actually working on the problem that we finally succeeded in solving, namely, how does heme control the synthesis of globin? And actually, 
This guy was the one who had discovered that uh, iron was necessary for protein synthesis in red cells. Uh, there's really nothing in common. There's the heme. There are four of them sitting in each of the four uh, subunits. Chemically, there's no connection whatsoever between heme, uh, the thing that carries the oxygen, and, 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 and the globin. So, how did the, so Vernon's problem was when was the heme added to the globin? And his hypothesis was that um, the ribosome, imagine there's a piece of messenger RNA here, and I'm a ribosome. I get onto the start of the message, start going down it. You have to imagine a tail of protein coming out behind me. It's coming out behind me, coming out behind me. And then finally, I get to the place where the heme can slot in. And what he said was that if there was no heme present, which you could easily do by starving the cells of iron, which is an essential component of heme, um, then the ribosomes would wait until they got a heme. And once they got a heme, then they could go on and, and finish the process. But it, it was clear from a sort of reanalysis of his uh, not very good data that um, he, he'd got it completely wrong. And if anything, the opposite was true. So we decided somehow, and I can't remember how this worked, to reinvestigate the matter. And we reinvestigated and found out he was completely wrong. There were no cues under any circumstances, although to be sure, we sort of created artificial cues just to show that we could detect a cue if a cue had formed. But there were no cues. Normally, the ribosomes were randomly distributed uh, under all circumstances. So um, that, 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 was, that was quite a nice piece of work for a PhD, and basically, Tony and I sort of collaborated on that. It was a bit too much for, well, it was certainly been too much for me. And Lou was in influential. He only stayed for a year, but he showed us how to make these reticulocytes. And here they are, these immature red cells which stain blue when you use the right kind of dye. And the, in the course of this, I ran into this guy here, Irving London, and worked in his lab one summer in New York and enjoyed that very much, and I sort of became very fond of working in America but through this experience and went back as a postdoc uh, when I'd finished my PhD in 1968. And here's the sort of, this is, this is the sort of effect. By this time, we could actually take the insides of these cells out. So if you add water to these cells, I mean, you just pack the cells down and then just add distilled water, they burst open and release their contents. And so if you do it right, you get... Uh, sort of 50% diluted cytoplasm. And amazingly, that 50% diluted cytoplasm, if you add back some right things to it, which we spent a lot of time working out, then actually they synthesize protein at a rate very similar to what they would have done if you hadn't burst them open. So you know, that's a bit of demystification. But if you don't add heme to this solution, then protein synthesis starts off okay, but after about five or 10 minutes, it, it dies and goes to a very low rate, although it actually keeps going a little bit. And what's nice is if you add back the heme, protein synthesis starts up again. So whatever this control mechanism is, it's reversible. And the fabulous thing about the system was you could uh, make this rabbit reticulocyte lysate preparation, just, the, just spinning off the debris and taking the supernatant, which was basically just diluted cytoplasm, store it in liquid nitrogen, and then do an experiment any time of the day or night. I mean, you could just go in and do an experiment. And it, it, a big batch, we'd make 400 mils of this stuff and store them in half mil aliquots or something like that. So, you know, it made it very easy. And you, you could do about three experiments a day if you were working hard. And, you know, the next experiment relied on the output of the first experiment and, 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 and so on. So progress was... Progress was, uh, or could in principle be quite rapid. But I, my progress wasn't terribly rapid, it must be confessed, because we didn't know enough at the time to solve the problem as it turned out. And so, because I was stuck in the main problem, we just kept on, re I mean, what, hap what would happen, it's interesting, we would just repeat this experiment over and over again, and it was fantastically repeatable, but if you just repeat the same experiment, of course you get the same result, hopefully, you don't learn anything new. So the question was how to do something new about it, and I couldn't see a way. So I started helping people, and one of the people I helped was Nahama, who was an Israeli visiting scientist, and her husband was a chemist, and they'd worked out a way to oxidize the glutathione inside the cell, and that inhibited protein synthesis. And it was thought that 
Glutathione is supposed to be a sort of um, a protective agent against um, free radicals. And it suddenly occurred to me that we didn't, so that they thought it was because of the loss of this glutathione. But I realized that the glutathione was being oxidized into oxidized glutathione. And I suddenly wondered one evening if it was actually the oxidized glutathione was bad rather than the lack of reduced glutathione which was, was bad. So I ordered some oxidized glutathione and to my astonishment found that tiny amounts of oxidized glutathione were deadly to the system. And again, it was, it was reversible. You say it would shut off and then if you quickly added some uh, a reducing agent, then protein sensors would take off again. So that was, that was very curious. It looked very much like the heme thing, but it was glutathione. So, you know, again, I didn't follow it up at the time, but it became very useful later on. And then, even more frustrated by my efforts to solve the main problem, um, I started thinking about mapping genes in polio virus. And don't ask me why I thought about that, but basically it was because there were people who worked on polio in the same institute. And so I went to Ellie and asked for some polio RNA and added, and, but it didn't get translated. So I thought, well, it must be that we're missing some factor from poliovirus infected cells. Let's add that back in. And I was astonished to find when we added poliovirus infected cytoplasm that protein synthesis shut off. And again, to cut a long story short, uh, it turned out that the active principle was double-stranded RNA, the, the replicative form of the virus was shutting off protein synthesis. And, and we, I could calculate from the amount I was adding that one molecule of double-stranded RNA, about 3,000 bases long, was enough to inhibit synthesis by about 10 million ribosomes. So it had to be catalytic. Um, and that was strange. But you know, I mean, that, the, the, the sort of interesting thing about that, that, that simple result was already a little letter to nature in those days. I mean, life was much easier then, I must say. You didn't have to find out terribly much to get a paper in Nature. Oh, I, think, I think things are harder now. But it was good, and it was fun to collaborate with Ellie, and we became good friends on the result. And then I went back to Cambridge, having made these two sort of seemingly random discoveries, which didn't seem to be very relevant to the matter at hand. And I took a huge cut in salary. My salary went from $11,500 a year to 800 pounds a year, which was about a, a five-fold reduction in salary. But that was OK, because I was among friends. And I collaborated and shared a lab with Richard Jackson and relied on sort of fellowships for about 10, 10 years. And it was, it was good. And we worked very well together. And it was fantastic. And in 1974, the lab burned down. And Richard rang up one Saturday morning and said, Tim, the lab has burned down. Don't bother to come in, because there's nothing left, which was kind of true, as you can see. Except it wasn't quite true, because the liquid nitrogen cylinder was still had some liquid nitrogen in it. So, but it was venting. It had lost its insulation. So we quickly found a spare liquid nitrogen uh, Dewar flask and transferred all the most precious samples into it and um, they were saved and it took six weeks to get a new laboratory up and running again which wasn't bad actually it turned out the, the university had a wonderful insurance policy and everything in the lab had been a little bit old and rusty and we got everything new so actually it was really rather good um, and also at the time um, we'd found out a lot of stuff, which I haven't, I haven't mentioned. I won't, it's too, it's too complicated, take too long to explain. Um, but basically, we were very confused at this point. And because all the lab books and everything burned up, you know, I mean, just whooshed, complete, completely gone, we had a sort of fresh start. It was rather like if you were a Catholic making a confession, you know, your past sins were just sort of swooshed out of the way. And um, the, the powers that be found a new lab for us. And it was opposite the MRC lab. Here, here is the MRC, the old MRC lab. It's now in much grander surroundings. And our lab was sort of roughly where I'm standing now as a teaching lab in the hematology department. And um, Max Perutz was the director of LMB at the time. And he had wonderful stores and very kindly said that we could use them. 
And they had a fantastically simple accounting system. You went into the stores and you said, I'd like a gram of ATP, please, or whatever it might be. You wrote one gram ATP in this little black notebook, and that was it. No triple filling out forms, no iPads, no credit cards, nothing. You just, the, the, the admin took care of all those details. It's fabulous. So you could get anything you wanted almost instantly. Um, and uh, Mrs. Perutz ran the canteen, and the canteen was a fantastic scientific educational place to be because it had all these heroes in. I mean, you know, it had Fred Sanger and Francis Crick and Max Perutz and John Gurdon, Cesar Milstein, Aaron Klug, John Walker, and all these people. I mean, these are my contemporaries, and those are my sort of scientific heroes. And to, you know, can you imagine what it must be like? I mean, what a privilege to be able to sort of sit down and Francis Crick comes and explains what he's thinking about nucleosomes. I mean, this was an absolute revelation uh, to me. And I realized that actually, you know, it didn't pay to be too clever. I mean, these people were just as puzzled as we were, but they were excited when they found out a clue. And, you know, and, 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 and the way of finding out a clue was doing an experiment, drawing a conclusion, designing a new experiment, making sure your back foot was well planted, and then taking a step forward. And then when this foot is well planted, you might be able to take another step forward. And so on, by a succession of tiny steps, which lead you in sort of random directions, you might arrive at the truth. And that's how it... So I thought these people were a little bit simple-minded, actually. I mean, they weren't... Some of them, you know, some of them were terribly clever. I mean, like Francis was fantastically clever, and Sidney uh, is fantastically... But Fred... Actually, he was fantastically clever. He won two Nobel Prizes, but his cleverness was in the doing of experiments and in his ambition and his aims. You know, he, he, if you met him, you would think he was the gardener or maybe the guy that looked after the drove the truck, you know, or something like that. He was completely unassuming, modest kind of a, a guy. And Max was, 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 was terrific. So, I mean, it was just wonderful knowing all these. I, I, you know, so I, I often tell people I was born with a scientific silver spoon in my mouth because this, this, we were there for about a year and it was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful... There's, there's lunchtime scientific conversations and the, the world in those days came to it. You know, you'd meet all kinds of famous people there because it was such a great place to be. Um, but I never actually officially worked there. We were across the road. Anyway, um, as a result of new equipment, new faces, new surroundings, and getting rid of this confusion of the past, um, we solved the problem. We found something that had taken us ages to find out, namely the inhibition of protein synthesis that I've shown you needed ATP. And the reason we'd missed it was because protein synthesis needed ATP. So not until we changed an assay did, um, did we figure it out. And basically, this is... This is minus and plus double-stranded RNA, and you can see, and it's labeled with P32, and this band gets a lot hotter when you add the double-stranded RNA, and it was, it was surprisingly easy to identify this band as being the initiation factor whose activity was inhibited by, by this condition. So, uh, the, 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 the answer was that there was a protein, this was my first protein kinase, a protein kinase which turns protein synthesis off. And it could, this protein kinase, we didn't know whether it was one or two or three, could be activated in a variety of ways, either by lack of heme or by the presence of double-stranded RNA or by the lack of um, glucose 6-phosphate, basically, a reduced NADP. So here it is, ATP as a adenosine triphosphate, one, two, three. The terminal phosphate goes on to protein, leaving you with ADP, which then gets recycled and made back into into ATP, and it's this that does the business. Here's an example of it. Here is an enzyme on the left, which by sticking that phosphate on there, becomes a hundred times more active. And, you know, if you look at these, these two structures, I don't know if you can see, but I mean, the, the changes are remarkably subtle. It's not the kind of thing that you could really predict by quantum chemistry, or maybe you could by very sophisticated modern quantum chemistry, but the, the, the changes are not, not terribly obvious, but it has biologically a tremendous uh, amplification. So we were quite pleased with ourselves and we organized a meeting, and in the course of that meeting I lent my bicycle to a guy called Tom Humphreys, and I'd invited Tom to the meeting because he was then the expert 
on sea urchin protein synthesis, and he worked in Hawaii. And he came to Cambridge and said, could he, go, could he rent a bicycle? I said, no, you can't rent a bicycle, but you can borrow mine. So we became friends because of that. So this was an incredibly important turning point. So you see, the things that influence your life are not always scientific. They can also be trivially human, just lending somebody a bicycle. So why was that so important? Well, it turned out, uh, by the way, this is Shent Georgie lived, I think, in a house about there. In, in Woods Hole. Um, it turned out that Tom was the director of a course in, in, in Woods Hole. He was the director of the embryology course. And he said, how would you like to come and teach in the embryology course next year? And um, maybe we can do some experiments on sea urchin eggs. So I said, oh, that would be great. Uh, so we agreed, to, we agreed to do that. Uh, so there's Tom. And this is Joan, his co-director, and Joan's student, Eric, and me, with quite much more hair in those days. <laughs> uh, that's um, Ed Southern at the back there. That's Andrew Murray, whose photograph you will see again. Um, Matt became a millionaire by selling RNA and then selling the company. Uh, he was also a bond broker in the end. I don't know what... How, Jerry is a is the head of the Genelia Farm campus. We were actually rather a distinguished bunch in those days. That was 1979. But um, this is why I was there, because I confirmed Borsuk's result. Unfertilized sea urchin eggs synthesize protein at a very low rate. But if you fertilize them, there is a little lag, and then protein synthesis takes off. And the question is, what is the switch that occurred there. And I assumed it would be something to do with phosphorylation of something, a protein kinase would change its activity. Um, turned out that wasn't quite true. It was a protein phosphatase changing its activity. And it didn't happen in all sea urchins. And that sort of, we never really did find out what turned on protein synthesis. But in the course of doing that, uh, we did take a look down the microscope. I mean, this, you add acid to the things, and everything biological is destroyed. But if you look down the microscope, this is what you see. It's tremendously speeded up, of course. But it's rather cool. I mean, you know, fertilized eggs, surprise, surprise, divide. <laughs> and they divide to make a hollow ball of cells. So that's what happens about an hour after fertilization normally, and then the subsequent divisions take place at about half hourly intervals. So I began to think about that. And then that summer, 79, John Gerhardt came through and gave a wonderful seminar about also, not about eggs, but about the cells that are going to become eggs, which are called oocytes. All of the girls in this room have oocytes inside them, which will eventually become, once a month, they become an egg which could, in principle, be fertilized. So these are frog oocytes, not human ones. And you'll see and what leads to their maturation is the hormone progesterone. So I'll just add a little progesterone. Not terribly dramatic. Beep. The white spot forms. So, well, if you look underneath the white spot, what you find is there's a second meiotic spindle. Again, I don't have time to go into all, but I learned a lot about meiosis, which I had never really understood before um, from these talks and from seeing in clams and with my own eyes. So basically what happens is that progesterone causes a transition. These actually go through two divisions, a first meiotic division, a second meiotic division, and then they get stuck at this stage with chromosomes stuck on this structure the second meiotic spindle. And what Gerhard described was experiments that had originally been done by uh, Yoshio Mizui in Yale with in Clem Market's lab. But there was an enzyme that apparently catalyzed cell division, which was turned on somehow by the progesterone. And the crucial factor is called MPF, maturation promoting factor. And the problem was that nobody could find out what MPF was. It was sensitive to heat, it was sensitive to protein digestive enzymes, so it was clearly a, a, a protein. But what it was, because if you tried to purify it, it disappeared, just vanished into thin air. And um, it was unclear why it was so unstable. And I thought when I heard this, you know, what a wonderful problem. What an absolutely delicious problem this is. And I wished that I could work on it, but I wasn't working on it. I was working on the control of 
protein synthesis. So, so there. And um, along the way, instead of being able to purify MPF, uh, John Gerhardt, together with the technician Mike Wu and Mark Kirshner, discovered that MPF actually goes up and down between the two meiotic divisions and always goes down when the cells aren't divided. And then it comes back for mitosis as well as meiosis. And every time the cells are actively dividing, you can find MPF. And every time they're synthesizing DNA, you can't find MPF. So this mysterious substance turns on and off. And nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew what turned it off, what turned it on. Nobody knew what turned it off. So it was a really good problem. And, uh, you know, it seemed to lie at the heart of the problem of how one cell uh, becomes two cells because it was clearly this enzyme that somehow was involved in catalyzing the process. And so I started reading a bit about the cell cycle and discovered that the cell cycle has M phase when the cells are dividing, my M for mitosis, then a gap, then S for DNA synthesis, another gap, and then back, and it goes round and round, and every time uh, you get twice as many cells as you started with. But it was known to be terribly complicated and when you sort of do it like this, this is a, a figure from a great big essay by Dan Mazier on mitosis, generalized plan of the time. And don't, you know, I mean, the only interesting thing was he did suggest that there might be some sort of trigger that actually got you from interphase into mitosis. And all these processes, half of them are wrong. I mean, it, it looks complicated. It is complicated. And it wasn't very well understood at the time at all. Now, what I didn't understand, and I haven't shown you, I've shown you sea urchin eggs dividing, but there's something I didn't tell you, which is those divisions are incredibly naturally synchronous. And I can demonstrate that now. I had some sperm. Boing! All the cells divide at the same time. Right? Fantastic. You could, I mean, you know, it begins to get loose synchrony a bit after the third third division, but the first three divisions, one hour, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, 150 minutes, are fantastically synchronous. And that turned out, I mean, I, I didn't pay any attention to that, but that was crucial for the next experiment. So one day, and this was three years later in 1982, um, the teaching part of the course had finished, so I was free to do whatever I wanted. And um, I think what was prompting me, I was actually interested in doing a bit of um, sort of uh, molecular religious studies because I became interested in virgin birth because I'd read a book about virgin birth in sea urchins. And it turned out you could make sea urchin eggs think they were fertilized just by adding wheat bases and mild soap solutions and things like that. So I was comparing patterns of protein synthesis in properly fertilized eggs with um, parthenogenetically activated eggs. And this is what I saw. Um, you see this protein here. So this is, you just label the eggs with, you fertilize them when they're fertilized. When you're sure they're fertilized, it's easy to tell. Um, you add the label and then you just take samples every 10 minutes. And uh, this is what I saw. So this is the first, this is a very strongly labeled band and it gets stronger and so it's the strongest band basically on, 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 on the gel. It has an apparent molecular weight of 40 something thousand. And then it faded away and then it came back again and then it faded away again. I think you can see that sort of more easily here. Boing, it comes and goes, it comes, it goes. You can't see it coming back because I think we've run out of label here. And this was in time to the cell divisions. Now, this is what I mean by an impossible result, because in those days, proteins just didn't disappear. It was impossible for proteins to disappear. Proteins can disappear in your gut when they're surrounded by digestive enzymes, sure, but they can't disappear from cytoplasm because, you know, everybody would disappear. But this one is very specific in its disappearance. The other ones just get stronger and stronger. But I'd seen it, you know, and there was no question. It was a very robustly well-controlled experiment, this. And so uh, we, I, I, and, you know, I'd had to sort of worry about, uh, want to, you can see it more clearly here. We looked in later on that summer in clams. 
And this is how cyclins A and B got their names. They were just labeled A, protein A, protein B, and protein C. And we were originally interested in them for quite another reason. And you see, I mean, really clearly here, they go away and they come back and they go away. And this band just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, it's beautifully controlled. And it was sort of impossible to imagine that there wasn't some connection between this disappearance and the disappearance of, of, of MPF. And the only thing, there were two things that worried me a lot about this. Number one, as you can see, the protein accumulates quite gradually, yet entry into mitosis is rather abrupt. So how can something gradual be converted into something abrupt? It's still a bit of a problem, actually. And the other one, could you really make enough protein in about 15 to 20 minutes to catalyze cell division? So we did some back-of-the-envelope calculations. And, um, which were not, not very accurate. But anyway, the, the, the bottom line is, yes, yes, that, that is okay. So I started to worry about the cell cycle and its control. And of course, the first papers I came across were those of Lee Hartwell, who had defined genes that controlled cell cycle uh, um, transitions. And then Paul Nurse, who followed in his footsteps using a different kind of yeast, had isolated genes that accelerate cell cycle uh, conditions. And basically, he discovered that the we one gene, uh, when you knocked it out, accelerated the cell cycle. And here is Paul flanked by two graduate students. And meanwhile, um, how to proceed? The answer was that I stopped working gradually the, on the control of protein synthesis and started to focus on, on cycling. And the key people were John Pines, who was the first person to clone sea urchin cycling, and Jeremy Minchel, who worked out the assay for how to clone it. And again, I won't, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. It took us a long time. And, um, and Jeremy also discovered that frogs had cycling. That was a wonderful moment, because once you know that frogs have cyclins, you know that humans have cyclins. I mean, when they were only in sea urchins and clams, you could have said, well, it's just weird sea creatures and invertebrates, but it's real. And then, uh, as soon as John had cloned um, sea urchin cycling B, I promised that I would send it to an old student of mine called Andrew Murray. And here he is with his daughter, Phoebe. She's quite a lot older. She's a teenager now. Um, and Andrew had used this amazing system. It, it's reminiscent of the re rabbit reticulocyte lysate. You take these of frog eggs now, and if you spin them, you get this beautiful layer of pure cytoplasm, which you can suck off. And this beautiful layer of uh, pure cytoplasm behaves exactly as though it was the inside of a frog egg. And if you add DNA to it, it forms these beautiful spindles with the, with the chromosomes lined up on the thing. And if you add calcium to this, which mimics the arrival of the sperm, then the, the I won't show you, I don't have a movie of that, but the, the chromosomes come apart. So this was fantastic. And, what Andrew showed was that if you, if you destroyed all the, the, the messenger RNA in the extract and then added new message, in this case, sea urchin uh, cycling message, then you could drive the cell cycle. And if you didn't add the message, if you, it, it, it didn't work. So he really proved beyond all doubt that it was cycling synthesis that drove the cell cycle. And then by cutting off the end terminus, he removed what we call the destruction box. And that then uh, made the cycling perfectly stable. And then they never got out of mitosis. So cycling synthesis is necessary to enter mitosis. And cycling destruction is necessary to exit uh, mitosis. And uh, that was basically it. And then the only question was, what did it do? And it, it took us an amazingly long time to figure this out. It turned out that cyclin was the activating subunit of Paul Nurse's uh, CDC2 gene. And the way it works is that this loop of protein here nestles in a crevice on the surface of the cyclin and, and allows this enzyme to work. So basically, what had previously seemed totally mysterious, and everything was horribly unstable and went away, um, was really terribly simple. You just made some cyclin, it turned on CDC2. CDC2 was a protein kinase that phosphorylated lots of proteins, and uh, that catalyzed mitosis. Then cyclin was destroyed, the CDC2 turned off, and the cell exited mitosis. What, what could be simpler? So this is, this is absolutely sort of typical Nobel Prize stuff. You've gone from total mystification, total unclarity, 
requiring something totally impossible. I mean, the idea that a protein disappearing might be important for cell cycle progression had never been even theoretically suggested by, by, by theoretical cell biologists because it was impossible. And it's only because I saw it with my own eyes that it became uh, possible and contemplatable. So much more recently, just sort of skipping to the very end, I became, so this is the idea, you, you phosphorylate all these proteins, they change their properties. I mean, let's not ask about the details. There are still many, many details here to be worked out. But I got interested in the problem of, of what happened at the end, because if it's true you only enter mitosis by sticking all these phosphates on, it must be true that you return to interphase by taking all those phosphates off. So the question is, who does that, and, and how is it regulated? Because if you think about it, if you have an enzyme putting the stuff on at the same time as taking an enzyme that's taking them off, you run into the same kind of trouble if you try and fill your bath without putting the, the plug in the, in, in, in the plug hole. So uh, I won't, I'm going to talk about that in Budapest, and I won't talk about that here. But basically, I mean, this is, this, is, this is my sort of model of scientific research. The path immediately ahead looks pretty straightforward, but it very soon goes over the brow of the hill, and we have no idea whether it enters the woods, whether it turns to the left, to the right, or goes straight on. And your job is to just follow that path wherever it leads uh, to the end of the road. And I think my final advice is basically just go for it. Don't worry, just go for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>